Hi, you're listening to an older episode. The podcast is now called Travel Writing World. You can find the episode show notes and much more at travelwritingworld.com. This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to All Over the Place, a podcast on travel, culture, and the creative life. Today's episode brings us to Miami, where I speak with Pico Iyer about life, death, travel, and his new book, Autumn Light, Season of Fire and Farewells. He has been an essayist for Time magazine since the mid-1980s and is a celebrated author of many books, including Video Nights in Kathmandu, The Lady and the Monk, and The Art of Stillness. So now, here is Pico Iyer. I am speaking with Pico Iyer about travel and his new book, Autumn Light, Season of Fire and Farewells, which if I'm not mistaken, was released a few weeks ago, April 16, 2019. It's it's an excellent uh, meditating memoir on life and death and change set in autumnal Japan. And it's a beautiful book. It has this nice decal edge <laughs> and a nice map on the end sheets. And I hope to get into it. Um, I would like to maybe first begin by asking you a little bit about yourself. Of course. Okay, well, so most of the audience will undoubtedly know who you are, um, but for those who may not have encountered your writing, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you see yourself? Yes, I suppose I could say I've been traveling my whole life because I was born in Oxford, England to parents from India, and then we moved to California when I was seven, so suddenly... By the time I was in the second grade, I was this curious little character with a, an Indian face and an English voice and uh, an American green card. And um, I actually thought this was quite an unusual blessing in those days to be given three uh, sets of eyes, essentially three ways of looking at the world and the chance to bring them together into different combinations so to set them off against each other to see England with American eyes and America with English eyes. Mm -hmm. And then by the age of nine, I started going to school in England, but returning three times a year to California to see my parents. So uh, every couple of months, I would get into a plane alone and fly over the North Pole to my 15th century English boarding school. And then two months later, fly back to my parents' yellow house on top of a mountain in the middle of hippie California. Mm -hmm. And I think that commute uh, has probably defined a lot of the writing. I've done since. And certainly it's, it made travel essentially my sense of home. I instantly felt most at home in the passageways or the conspiracies between cultures rather than in any one fixed place. And then finally, uh, in my last year at school, when I was 17, I actually ended up spending every, con every season in a different continent. So I think by the time I arrived at college, I felt as Melville said, that my whaling ship was my Harvard and my Yale, that really I, what I learned out on the streets and loose in the world would be much richer and more formative than anything I could get in a classroom. And so ever since travel has been my second nature, and I'm very at home being a foreigner almost everywhere. Mm. You've talked and written about notions of home and identity in the past, and I think I've uh, come across those even in some of your recorded TED Talks which I can put the links in the show notes. Um, and I, I think in one of those talks, you, you mentioned home is, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher your quote, but you say something to the effect of home is not about soil, but it's about soul. Can you talk a little bit about this idea um, in, in light of where you're living now, in particular in Japan? Yes. So I think because growing up, I was never really entirely in India or England or the US or anywhere else, I quickly got the sense that home was portable and invisible mm. and that home was essentially what lives inside me rather than where I happen to live at any given point. Home would be my 
parents in those days, my wife now, my favorite monastery, the song that's always going through in my, my head, the book that I always have in my carry-on. And then um, a few years later, or actually after I began writing, when I was in my early 30s, my family home burnt to the ground in a forest fire with me more or less inside it, and I lost everything in the world. Uh, that night I had to buy a toothbrush. It was the only thing I had in the world. And that really underscored my sense that home was not a physical place, but as you say, uh, something metaphysical or something that I would carry with me. And I think having my house burned down made it that much easier to settle in the most alien place I know, which is Japan. And although I've been based there for 32 years now, uh, I spent all those years on a tourist visa. I feel deeply close to Japan, but I would never presume to be Japanese. Uh, and I suppose living in the most foreign place I know as a tourist speaks for a little bit of my sense of um, how I've navigated the world. I love being a tourist because to a tourist, everything is new and therefore interesting and therefore worth bringing one's attention to. And I think also growing up, I quickly got the sense that home was not really about where you come from so much as where you're going and that I would much rather be defined by my ideals than by my ethnic origin, that, that my passions were more important than my passport, you could say. And so um, in that sense, too, I've made my home uh, in a place where I don't speak much of the language. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Japanese food. I never wear mm. Japanese clothes. But at some much subtler, deeper level, uh, I feel I'm on the same wavelength as Japan. I understand it and I feel it understands me. In, in a far deeper way than uh, California or England or India um, ever would. And I think we all have these secret homes. But one of the blessings of the modern moment is that a few of us, lucky ones, um, can actually live in the place that feels most like one's home, as I do, and still keep up with one's friends and bosses on the other side of the world, thanks mm -hmm. to um, the latest technology. So no generation before could really do that. But um, And the curious thing, which sometimes my friends are surprised about, is that uh, I came upon Japan only because I had an unwanted layover at Narita Airport um, near mm -hmm. Tokyo. Uh, many years ago, I was flying back from Hong Kong to New York City, where I was living and working. Uh, I spent 20 hours near the airport in Tokyo. I walked around the little town there. And on the basis of a morning walking around an airport town, I decided to move to Japan to leave my comfortable seeming job. And I've been delightedly there ever since. I'm, I'm thinking about what was the initial draw uh, that that pulled you to, to Japan? And I think it was just intuition. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a sense of familiarity, the way uh, you or I might meet a stranger in a crowded room tonight and feel that somehow we have more in common with that stranger mm -hmm. or she understands us better than most, many of our friends and family. So, of course, I could put reasons to it, but I wouldn't really believe those reasons because I think affinity operates uh, on a sub-rational or supra-rational level. And really, it was just in that airport town, waiting to board my plane, walking into a temple garden on a late October day when um, the sky was blazingly blue, but there was a first pinch of cold and coming dark in the air. Looking around at a group of five-year-old kids who were just collecting acorns and being pierced by this sense that I knew that, that scene. And I knew mm -hmm. it better than I knew the apartment where I was living uh, in Midtown Manhattan and I knew it better than the street on which I had grown up in Oxford, England. And um, and then deciding that if I didn't follow that intuition, I, as Thoreau would say, could uh, die feeling I'd never lived, that there would always be something unresolved within me. And I think every traveler knows um, how you're walking down the street in Bogota or Havana or Bangkok, wherever it might be, and you see an avenue or a back street. And you think, if I don't go along that to the end, I'm going to spend the rest of my life wondering what's there. Or you meet, meet a person on an island in the Gulf of Thailand for a day, and you decide, well, I've got to pursue that person to continue mm -hmm. the conversation. Otherwise, um, I will never be settled in my regular life. So it was just really that kind of impulse. But I believe in impulses more than the reasons I might fashion. And so impulse, I think, can be better trusted than um than my rational mind. Mm -hmm. Sounds like uh, falling in love with a place or an idea 
Exactly, exactly. That beautifully said. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, when I so I was working writing on world affairs for Time Magazine at that point, and I left Time Magazine to go and live in a monastery in the back streets of mm-hmm. Kyoto, and I thought that would be a good complement to my rather accelerated life, four blocks from Times Square. And uh, my third week in the, trying to live in a temple in the back streets of Kyoto, uh, I met the woman who would become my wife. So then it literally became a matter of falling mm. in in love. And uh, and probably I, could, I wouldn't have fallen in love if it had been any other country in the world. Somehow Japan was ready to accept me as nowhere else was or vice versa. And so the, the book I had contracted to write about my year of serene contemplations in the monastery became a book about watching this one Japanese woman I met who was married with two kids at the time, transform her life as dramatically and efficiently as Japan had done in 1945 in the ruins of war. So um, literally falling in love and every traveler knows that in the best trips, um, every expectation and plan gets upended and something else uh, takes over and it's usually much more to be trusted. And so this reference you're um, you're talking about is uh, the book, uh, The Lady and the Monk? Yes, exactly. So that was a book I wrote about Japan Mm -hmm. essentially 31 years ago, my first year in Japan. And as you were saying, initially, um, I've now written a book after 31 years there, which I was hoping would be the sort of autumnal complement to the springtime romance I described before. Mm. I've been thinking about this more lately. I did some some studying, some research in in Madrid. And the, the, the moment that I stepped off of the train and walk down Calle Tocha, a Tocha Street, which runs from the train station to basically the central plaza of Madrid. For the very first time, I, you know, I had this pull, this, I don't know, this Wordsworthian kind of sublime sensation of falling in love with this city that it's so hard for me to articulate. But there was something about that place and that time that drew me into it. And it happened to be also in the autumn. There's something magical in the air, <laughs> right? In, in the autumn. Oh, exactly. Yes, precisely. Well, I love I love hearing that, and that's exactly the the pull or the call uh, that that I responded to. It's it's funny that it would be in the autumn, but I think the autumn for me is a, appealing because it's when buoyancy and wistfulness interact, or when radiance and melancholy deepen one another. And in the book I just published, I was thinking about a lot of the Japanese films of the 1950s mm-hmm. in which you hear a wonderful festival in the streets outside that somebody is room, uh, is sobbing in the room next door and how to bring the sob and the festival together. In other words, how to bring the facts of life, which have to do with coming winter, together with the, the hope and wonder and beauty without which we couldn't really be um, surviving. But uh, I love the fact that that Spain summoned you. And I'm sure everybody listening to this has something in her own life that, that reminds her of that sensation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly uh, travelers uh, will know that sensation well. So throughout the book, I guess your new book we're talking about, there, there are a few moments where, and I don't know if this is an offensive term, but the, the gaijin idea about being a foreigner or an outsider in Japan comes to light in several points. Um, has this somehow complicated your sensations of feeling at home in, in Japan? Uh, no, it hasn't. Um, because uh, I'm, I'm foreign in, in face mm-hmm. and name and background, and I'm deeply at home in every way that matters. And I think in a place like California, I'm and in the United States generally, I'm very warmly welcomed. And mm-hmm. this country is wonderful in taking in people from every corner of the globe, but I will never feel American. And I, ha- I don't think there's any connection really between feeling welcomed and feeling at home. Uh, so it used to be that... Um, um, every time I would fly back to Japan, uh, they would strip search me at customs and uh, I look exactly like what they don't want to see coming into their country because I'm dark skinned and mm. they can rightly imagine that uh, my ancestry belongs in one of the poorer countries of Asia. And and they've worked so hard in Japan to construct this beautifully uh, functioning, seamless society that works like a, 
a symphony orchestra almost, in which everyone knows her part. And they all harmonize to play Beethoven's um, Eighth Symphony beautifully. And then suddenly somebody comes in from outside who can't read music, who doesn't have a score, who's falling over his feet, and it's going to disrupt everything they've worked so hard to do. So some of the reasons why they weren't so happy to see me speak to exactly the reasons I find Japan such a beautiful and harmonious place to be in. And of course, once I'm through customs, everyone couldn't be kind of more gracious and, and more thoughtful. I've never met a place that's more defined by kindness than Japan, which is probably ultimately the reason that I would want to spend all my, my days there. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be a foreigner. And one reason I live on a tourist visa is to keep myself honest and to remind myself however long I live there, however well I could speak Japanese, I would never be Japanese, nor would I want to be necessarily, and nor would any of my beloved neighbors want me to be. They they like me because I'm not Japanese, and um, I like their lives probably because I'm not Japanese and I'm not subject to <laughs> some of the same social pressures. So, um, yes, uh, the fact that I'm not welcomed in, at customs um, and that often walking down the street, people may be apprehensive when they see me coming in Japan, which would never be the case elsewhere. That really is uh, almost operates on a different level from the one on which um, I feel instantly at home. Mm, the history of isolationism in Japan, it seems like there's a paradox here because there, I've never been to Japan, but from what I understand, uh, they're just so friendly and kind and open to all walks of life, despite that, that history. So it seems to be there. Um, an interesting paradox. Yes, yes, a paradox, or it may, in the Japanese mind, which is less binary than ours, mm. make for a kind of um, logic, because um, I think they're very kind to us because they don't feel intruded upon or threatened by us. And they're the perfect hosts, and they would love us to be the perfect guests. But they, um, famously in Japan, when you... If you when you do visit, if you're there for two weeks, they'll be so thrilled to see you and to share the graces of their culture with you. If you go there and want to live there for two years or two decades, they may be a little more unsettled. And Japan is one of the curious places where the more a foreigner speaks Japanese, the less many locals are happy because they feel trespassed upon. And, and it doesn't really compute uh, with the sense of isolation and difference that has always as you say, been such a strong part of Japan. Whereas a foreigner goes there, says konnichiwa and sushi and nothing else, and then leaves after two weeks. I think that's exactly what they're most comfortable with. Because, because, as you say, they were a hermit kingdom for more than 200 years and um, have never really been on the global wavelength. So to this day, um, the standard of English in Japan, for example, which is essentially the most developed nation in um, Asia, is lower than in North Korea or Cambodia or Nepal or Indonesia or anywhere except Laos. Out of the 30 countries in Asia, Japan ranks 29th in terms of English proficiency, although it probably has the best educational system of anywhere. Yeah. Um, and I think that speaks for the moated nature of the country and the way that they still do keep their um, distance from the rest of the world, which geopolitically has had really bad consequences for them, but culturally it's had wonderful consequences mm -hmm. for us because when when you do go to Japan, you will find it's not like anywhere else and that even amidst all the baseball stadiums and McDonald's outlets and, and pinball arcades, it is deeply an 8th century country and difficult to, to fathom and very hard to anticipate and therefore for any traveler really um, the ultimate pot of gold, I would say. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, it's something that you can uh, sense and feel the farther you get from Tokyo. So in Kyoto or in, in the small town that you live in, you can get a sense of that history more? Or I, You can certainly get a sense of the history more where I live because mm -hmm. I'm in the very modern suburbs of Nara, which was the capital in the year 710. So I'm living in a kind of Steven Spielberg stage set on the outskirts of an 8th century city. But I think even in Tokyo, um, nothing computes. Uh, you, you have an emergency and you dial 119 instead of 911. You go to the baseball stadium and you hear about two and three counts. And you hear that a baseball game, if the score is level after 12 innings, ends in a tie. 
um, everything you think you know from the West uh, takes a different form there. You go to McDonald's in September and they're serving moon viewing burgers, uh, pat- beef patties with eggs on them to honor the great East Asian festival of the harvest moon. And I think mm-hmm. often in Japan, beautifully, it's the most familiar things that actually seem the most foreign. So even even in Tokyo, where one might be able to read the signs and where there's some little more English spoken, you instantly realize you're not in Shanghai, Seoul, or Hong Kong. You are on another planet. Mm. So you are, I'm, I guess I'm catching you as you're going on a, a book tour? Throughout. Yes, that's right. Right. Okay. Um, so were you in Japan when the the new emperor Naruhito came to power? or I wasn't. I, I wrote a piece for the World Post about that. And I think my piece was that, of course, it's a great ceremonial change and there's mm-hmm. a now a new name to the Japanese calendar. But the beauty of Japan is, for us as foreigners, that nothing ever really changes. Uh, and that the more it changes on the surface, the less it changes deep down. And this reminds me in that sense of, let's say, an old man who wears planet Hollywood t-shirt and then wears a beautiful spotless uh, tuxedo tonight and tomorrow is dressed in a perfect blue blazer and white shirt and red tie in absolute western way but none of that is going to make him less Japanese than he was so indeed the the new emperor was educated at Oxford almost the same time as I was his Mm. his bride was educated at Oxford and Harvard Um, so if you look on the surface they represent a, a, a world of change and of course they weren't uh, the emperor, current emperor, wasn't believed to be a god when he was born, as his grandfather was. And yet, I remember his grandfather, who was a wartime emperor during the most convulsive change in Japan's modern history. In 1975, after Japan had been devastated in the in the war and rebuilt itself, he said to a group of journalists, well, basically post-war and pre-war, I think there's no change. Hmm. So to us... It looks as if Japan has done a total transformation and is exactly moving the reverse direction in 1975 from 1935. But in a Japanese view, which is much a larger way of thinking things and much more long term, nothing has changed whatsoever. And I think that's certainly true as emperors come and go. Um, In the years I've been there, I think I've seen 18 prime ministers go, (laughs) come and go, and (laughs) none of that uh, really seems to make much of a difference to the Japan I recognize. And does this um, idea of permanence or change, does this also translate to the idea of seasons? Yes, I mean, exactly as you said at the beginning of this conversation, so perfectly, uh, because the beauty of the autumn is it's a constantly changing symptom of an essentially changeless cycle. And the wonder of the seasons, which I think of as essentially the religion of Japan, as fixed as a cathedral, is that they keep on turning. And every year when I go out into my neighborhood park to look at the blazing maple leaves in late November, I'm a little different. Japan's a little different. The world has experienced 12 more months of activity. Mm -hmm. And yet, at some level, it's the same thing that, that I am observing. It's like a church in the falling snow and in the blazing sun and everything is changing around it but the church to some extent and certainly its purpose uh, and the reason it draws people remains very changeless and so i think autumn is a is a riddle of change and changelessness which is exactly um what drew me to japan and what drew me to autumn as a subject um, of my book because my new book begins with my father-in-law dying and mm-hmm. everything up in the air and my mother-in-law being taken to a nursing home and my daughter returning from eight years in Spain and all the kind of things every family knows. But then it poses the question, how much has changed really? And um, you know, each year I'm getting a little older, but I'm guessing somebody who knew me at the age of six meeting me tomorrow would recognize a lot and say, oh, you're really exactly the same person. And I think that's a rather universal phenomenon. And I think in Japan, because they see things in terms of centuries rather than in terms of months, um, they're much more conscious of what doesn't change than we in the United States might be. Mm. This idea of turning and changing, um, somewhere towards the end of the book, there's this lovely volta or, you know, this meta volta, this meta turn, um, where the book 
begins to refer to itself. I guess you're, mm-hmm. uh, there's a moment where you're speaking to your wife and you're talking about what has been happening in the book that you've been writing, which is the book that I'm holding in my hands now. And you, you tell her nothing happens. Yes, right? exactly. Which is in some ways true and in some ways it's not true because a lot happens. But um, there's a sense that um, in terms of Western narrative, we expect for the big explosions and you know the big incidents, the inciting incidents. But here it's a, a more nuanced uh, kind of story and a nuanced mode of life. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this idea, this this turn that happens in the book about nothing happening in the book. <laughs> yes, no, that's a wonderful uh, perception. I'm so glad you picked it up and brought it up now. So exactly as you say, um, the Western narrative is all drama, especially nowadays in an action movie, say, mm-hmm. uh, lots of car crashes, constant movement, and then we get the, the Kiss, the kiss or the clinch in the final credits. And the Eastern narrative feels that nothing ever ends any more than the seasons and the turning of the seasons ever ends. And one person dies and another person is born. And that um, it's almost artificial to impose an end on, on the flow of life. That life is not a single structure like a house, it's a river. Um, and the water is constantly changing, but the river is much the same. And so, um, yes, having lived in Japan for 32 years, you can imagine how hard it was to write a very short book about it. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was drawing on more than half a lifetime of experiences and events and, um, and dramas, in fact. And so I really worked hard to keep, as you perfectly observed, to keep all the dramas and the events out in honor of that Japanese sense that life is really what happens between the lines. And that um, it's absences that define us more than presences. And silences say more than words. And we think the big moment is, for example, in my case, when my house burnt down. But really, the bigger moment might be the morning after Mm -hmm. when my life is in ashes. And I'm thinking, where do I go now? I have nothing left in the world, but I have to do something. And there's no drama attached to that moment. But that's the moment in which I make my life, even as losing my house and almost my life in the fire is when life is having its way with me. And there's a wonderful Japanese film director called Ozu, Mm -hmm. who flourished in the 1950s and made a film that is often called the greatest film ever made, Tokyo Story. And the fascination of his films is that they're all about and the, the camera is always completely stationary. It's on the level of the tatami. It's set usually in a family house within a neighborhood. And again, to all intents and purposes, nothing is happening. There's a train whistle in the distance. A neighbor looks in. People come in and out of the room. And then, most of all, uh, there is nothing. The, the, the camera will just linger on an empty room for many, many moments, and there'll be more emotion in that than there is when people are chattering. And so that was very much a model I was trying to use here, because I think everybody listening to this podcast knows that moment when he walks into a sweetheart's room, when she's not there, and he sees a strand of hair or a postcard or an earring. And somehow, the person he loves comes home to him more piercingly and deeply in that moment than when she's two feet in front of him talking mm-hmm. away. Um, that, that Again, emotion doesn't have so much to do with, with presence, really, but with suggestion. So I wrote a whole book about nothing happening. Flaubert <laughs> in the 19th century once said he was doing that. Patti Smith in her M train recently kept, keeps on saying it's so hard to write a book about nothing happening. And it is very hard, harder than to write an action movie. And at the end of my book, um, as you were just saying, my wife, who likes action much more, she's probably more Western than I am, although she's Japanese, or because she's Japanese, she says, oh, you know, rain is trickling down a window pane and there's a car moving outside and the light is coming in. You've done a, you've, you're writing probably an inaction movie. You're you're the kind of guy who likes nothing happening. I say exactly. That's what I've tried to do. And I think every person who's a travel writer knows that when you write a book, the book has to teach the reader how to read it. The book mm-hmm. establishes the terms on that the reader um, is accepting when he enters the book. And so 
I always scatter little clues like that to the reader in my books to give them a sense, this is what the point is meant to be. In this case, this, as you perfectly noticed, this is a book about nothing happening. And if you're looking for a dramatic change, um, you'll be sorely disappointed. But if you're looking for the rhythm of life in a neighborhood that as it keeps on flowing past, regardless of the people coming and going in the foreground, then um, maybe you you will recognize something um, in this in this book, and because I know that that's um, not so thrilling or delightful to many a reader. At the same time as I was writing this book, I was writing a contradictory book about Japan that's full of snap, crackle, and pop, and that I'm bringing out from the same publishers at the end of the summer. And my thought was um, to write one sustained narrative for those people who might be interested in the story of nothing happening, and to offer a very different kind of book that's almost like a series of tweets for those people who want to be provoked, <laughs> manipulated, and perhaps um, enraged by a, a bombardment of uh, subjective perceptions about Japan. Well, you, as you say, nothing happens, yet the book pulls the reader in. Um, I, I sat and I would have finished the, the book in one sitting had I not had other obligations to, to, to tend to. Um, there's something that pulls you into this narrative. It's it's very refreshing in some ways um, from the old friends of yours who who are playing fierce games of ping pong. <laughs> yes, to, indeed. To the tensions, uh, the familial tensions. There's something you know very very refreshing about the the pace of the book. So um, I don't want to undermine the power or the interest in this book by saying nothing happens. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I love what you just said. And of course, that's the nicest thing that you could say. And, I, and certainly um, the best thing any writer hopes for is somebody who wants to read the book at one sitting. Because I think I think of this book as, a, as something of a movie um, in prose, but an art house movie more than a blockbuster Guardians of the Galaxy mm -hmm. movie. And what you were describing is, I think what all of us feel, and perhaps actually one of the reasons people want to listen to podcasts now, even more than tune into YouTube perhaps, is we're craving intimacy, we're craving the undistractedness of hearing the human voice, mm -hmm. and we're craving almost a world without car crashes. We've got so much between um, social media and the mass media and our cell phones. We've got such a information overload and such a constant clatter and chatter and bombardment in our lives. I think people turn to podcasts as a way to stretch open their um, attention and to settle into something richer and deeper. And so, as you say, with a book, there are two at least two kinds of books. One is somebody shouting all the time and telling you a dramatic story and raising his voice and lowering his voice to hold you. And the other is just talking about his life. And if mm -hmm. you can do that um, compactly and compellingly enough, I think many of us find that a much deeper um, form of communication. And I, mm -hmm. like you, I much prefer hear somebody to hear somebody quietly tell me um, under the subtext, the understory, the secret story of his life, rather than, oh, and then I got a divorce, and then somebody smashed <laughs> my car, and then my husband down, and, and that, that can, I think we're getting too much of that nowadays, and sometimes we want to move in um, the other direction. So I'm really glad if, if you did have that response, and I was working so hard for 16 years to try to create a, a quiet current that would draw the reader in the way that somebody who is whispering actually pulls us forward towards them, where somebody who is shouting actually often causes us to recoil and to move away. Mm -hmm. So this is very much a book without shouts. Yeah, that same uh, point in the book where you, um, we, we spoke about the turn, where it's self-referential, um, You, uh, I think it's, it's you speaking here, um, where you mentioned to your wife, you say something to the effect that it's hard to see or to know which parts of a book are important until, you know, many years down the line. And, you know, this struck me as I was reading it, there were references to the Fukushima disaster, but references to that being seven months ago. And that happened right in 2011. So could you talk a little bit about your process of writing this book and how long it took you and the process? Absolutely. So, um, 
I know you are a teacher, and this term, for the first time in 37 years, I've been uh, back in a classroom teaching writing on place. And I think the main thing I've been um, conveying to my students is the importance of focus and structure. And the more you know the subject and the more material you have, the more that becomes important. So I was faced, as I was writing this book, with, I would say, 8,000 pages of notes, uh, mm-hmm. because 32 years of my life in Japan. And I would take 10 pages of those notes, and I would carefully organize them and annotate them. And then I'd go to the supermarket to buy a carton of milk and come back with 12 new pages of <laughs> observations and vignettes I thought that I really needed to um, include. And so... I decided at some point uh, to concentrate my 32 years in Japan into just one autumn season, just this small, Mm -hmm. nondescript neighborhood. And as we've been saying, um, everything that is happening between the dramas. And some of the extra stuff that I have that I thought was irresistible will appear in the second book, which covers everything from baseball to love hotels to fashion to, to Zen meditation. But I wanted really to keep a very, very clear and undistracted line. Again, I think with every book, I want to write it, I want to make the style a homage to the subject. And in this case, I really wanted to make my book Japanese. And the first thing that strikes everybody about a Japanese aesthetic is it's really the aesthetic of an empty room. The traditional Japanese room is you go in, there's a tatami mat, and there's nothing there but a vase and a scroll. And because there's nothing there but a vase and a scroll, you bring your full attention to each one of those two things, Mm. and you find in each one of them a universe, as opposed to going into a typical room where there may be 600 things, and we can't give much of ourselves to any one of them. And so, really, for me, this was an act of subtraction. And the longer I've been writing, and I've been a full-time, essentially, freelance writer for 32 years now, Mm. um, the more I see how writing is not about adding and elaborating and amplifying, but stripping down to the core so that really, as I was saying before, it's the silences that speak. And so um, it really was a struggle for me because I have a mind that's like a Bollywood stage set. I mean, my mind is full of uh, overbright, it's riotous, it's too loud, people constantly singing and dancing and somersaulting across it. And to still that mind and actually to try to get this quiet, even flow um, was really difficult. But I thought it would be a very good challenge for me as a writer because I've written other much louder and brighter books before. And for me, as a writer about travel, the real travel I do is on the page. And what I always want to do in any new book is look around the corner and take my imagination somewhere it hasn't been before, take my prose to a new continent that is entirely fresh to it. And so the content is always much less important to me than how I'm going to make the exercise of writing fresh to myself. And to speak to your question about the process, I always try to make aspects of the process different to try to catch some degree of freshness, because if I don't have a sense of discovery, the reader won't. And so I want to be stimulated and surprised by the act of writing each time. And uh, if I am, then my hope is that the reader will catch some of that by contagion. Hmm. And so has your has your process of writing differed from, say, Video Nights in Kathmandu to today? Oh, radically, yes. And of course, yeah, that book I wrote in my 20s, and um, um, I wrote it 34 years ago. So we're all different from between the age of, let's say, 26 and 60. But it's, in my case, a very conscious um, change. So I wrote my first book, The Dear Night in Kathmandu, on a very brief leave of absence from my job in New York City. And so I had to travel across Asia and write a 350-page book in seven months. (laughs) So I was moving very, very quickly. I spent four months traveling around 10 countries in Asia, and then I went back to California and essentially wrote the whole book in um, three months. Uh, and so the book moves very, very fast, and it's, it's rich with detail and, and, and energy, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a fast book. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I'd finished that book, I moved to Japan, and I decided to write a book in 1987 about going nowhere. And my thought was this, this definitely going to be the opposite of Video Night in Kathmandu. Video Night in Kathmandu was 10 countries in four months. Now I'm just going to be in one city, Kyoto, Japan, for a year. So everything is going to be slower and more patient and more attentive. And after publishing that book, The Lady and the Monk, which you mentioned, my next book was 
about eight different countries again and um, uh, much more on the move. So um, I'm constantly trying to vary the pace the way I think any musician or any piece of music really has to um, match staccato and legato and very fast uh, passages with deeply slow ones. And in, in this current book, Autumn Light, I have four sections that are really meant to be almost four movements, mm -hmm. uh, the way you would have in a piece of music. And each one has a very different color and pace and rhythm, but all of them are indeed very different, I hope, to ways I've written before. Mm -hmm. I was uh, flipping back through Lady and the Monk in, in preparation for today's talk, and something that I didn't pick up on when I first read it was that that book too was divided into uh, four sections uh, seasonally, right? Beginning with the end, right? Beginning with autumn, and now there is this, um, as you mentioned in the in the acknowledgments of your current book, that autumn light is not necessarily a sequel, but it's a kind of rounding out of of that experience thirty years later. Exactly. And it's about uh, putting autumn next to spring and seeing what spring has, which autumn doesn't. Which, and there are many things such as freshness and rising sunshine and things blossoming and what autumn has that spring might um, very much envy. And just as you say, um, The Lady and the Monk, the subtitle was Four Seasons in right. Kyoto. But in fact, it was five seasons because I began in autumn, I completed the four seasons, and then that book ended with my second autumn, which is much more meaningful mm. than my first autumn because the first autumn was when I arrived and everything was exciting and I was discovering a person and a city and a lifestyle. And the second autumn was when I thought I was going to say goodbye to all of those. And so suddenly the true meaning of autumn, which is elegy and, and, and wistfulness and, and sayonara, was coming home to me and I was becoming that much more Japanese. So because I'd written that book, which was subtitled Four Seasons in Kyoto, um, my original working subtitle for the new book was One Season in the Suburbs. And again, they're very much meant to go together. Mm -hmm. The Four Seasons of Kyoto was partly, you know, that book is quite mac maximalist and expansive. There's a lot in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about Kyoto. I'm suddenly arriving at a foreign city that is one of the storied places in the world, and I want to romance it and learn about it. One Season in the Suburb, instantly, is meant to sound much duller and much more mm -hmm. to evoke what we were talking about, nothing hope happening. And the suburbs is meant to be universal. After 32 years of living in Japan, I'm not as fascinated by Kyoto and Nara as I was as a arriving tourist, but um, I see much more of how the emotions and the cycles in Japan play out as they would anywhere. And it's a much more universal landscape for me than when I was in the first flush of discovery. So what you mentioned was absolutely in my mind, how to set these two books together, even though they represent the same person and some of the same characters and places at um, a 30 year remove. And in fact, with the, I think of the Lady in the Monk as a very Western book, and it's mm. about a Westerner encountering Japan and through a romance, slowly beginning to feel bits of Japan come into his, um, into his system. But one of the main themes in The Lady in the Monk is, should we have a Western ending or a Japanese ending? Should we have um, a wonderful conclusion and a resolution with the credits playing, or should we have something unresolved and mm -hmm. a little poignant and haunting? And I worked so hard to create a Japanese ending for that book, uh, in which it looks as if I leave this wonderful woman um, that I just discovered, and I'm leaving Japan. And in real life, of course, I never left her. I never left Japan. But I wanted a Japanese ending for that book. And in this new book, which has a much more death and sadness in it, I deliberately didn't want to have a sad ending. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to have something that holds um, the blue skies and the rusting leaves of autumn together in a frame and to understand that neither really has meaning without the other. Mm. Well, yeah. And, and there are some, without giving too much away, unresolved uh, narratives in, in, in the new book. But, you know, you're right. At the end, you know, I don't have the sense that um, I feel let down as a, as a reader being that there are some unresolved uh, narratives or dots that aren't necessarily connected as life is. As life is. I mean, everyone listening to this conversation has so many unresolved things. What will happen to 
um, the person you love tomorrow? What's going to happen to your parents and your siblings? Are you going to have the same job next year that you had now? And to bring um, to artificial closure any life uh, is to impose almost unnatural degree of art upon nature because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, our, our lives keep on running like a stream until they don't. And in Japan, even when somebody dies, uh, he's still regarded as a part of the neighborhood. So my wife, every morning to this day, wakes up, she heats some water for her father's uh, favorite tea, she gathers his favorite snacks, she puts out his favorite breakfast for him six years after he died. Because as far as she's concerned, her father is in need of sustenance and wants to have breakfast with her as much as he did when he was physically present. And at certain times in the year, um, lanterns are set up around mm-hmm. all the gravestones in Kyoto to lead lead the departed back from their heavens uh, to look in on their loved ones here on earth for uh, three days. And sometimes my friends will say to me, isn't Japan a very crowded country? Because the population density is quite high and there are 127 million people in a small amount of space. And I say in that sense, it isn't because the Japanese are so good at quiet and self-containment. They're so used to living in close quarters for a long time that even on a jam-packed Tokyo subway train at rush hour, you don't feel particularly intruded upon. But it is crowded in the sense that uh, spirits are everywhere Mm -hmm. and that the dead have never departed. And that for my Japanese wife, um, she's conducting conversations every, every, all the time with her long parted grandmother, with her late father, with the mother who just passed away. Um, And when she kicks a table inadvertently, she apologizes to the table because in Japan, the table too has a spirit and a glass of water has a spirit and a blade of grass has a spirit. So in that way, in, that, in those ways, it's a very saturated landscape, full of living things, in a way that's mm. hard for the rest of us to conceive. Mm. There's a seems like there's a, a, a veneration for the living and the dead and all things, uh, and animism. Yeah, oh, so much. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, I think respect is one of the most beautiful qualities in Japan, as you say. Um, it is brought to a computer, it's brought to a robot, it's brought to a piece of paper. And that's why I think some foreigners, when they arrive, are taken aback when they hear about robots um, performing weddings in Japan or the hotels in Japan mm-hmm. that are staffed entirely by robots. But in Japan, the lines between animate and inanimate and the lines between living and dead run very differently from the way they do with us. And... Um, what we think is so strange isn't at all to them. I think in one of my, in the book that I'm bringing out um, later this summer. What is the name of this? Called a, uh, sorry? Sorry, what was the name of the new book? Yes, and so the, and the new book, which is called A Beginner's Guide to Japan, uh, and as I say, is very, very different and probably more user or reader friendly than Autumn Light. Um, I have a little section about the phenomenon that has got a lot of press in this country recently whereby if an aging couple don't have a daughter who wants to look after them, or if their daughter has moved to California, um, they will literally hire an actress who every Sunday will come to their door and knock and say, hi, mom, hi, dad, I've really been missing you. I really hope we can have a wonderful Sunday lunch together. And they will suspend disbelief to fill the hole Mm. in their hearts. And to us, that's very strange. We can't quite make that leap in many cases. But for the Japanese, it's a very practical solution to to a very real problem. Uh, And again, that almost speaks for the many ways in which the Japanese conception of reality is far different than ours. Mm -hmm. Wow. This reminds me of what we've heard about um, in Japan, bars or nightclubs uh, in which uh, lonely women go to uh, get courted by by young men. Well, yes, exactly. And in fact, when I mentioned this case of um, parents hiring actresses to play their daughters, a friend of mine who knows Japan very well, a uh, um, European friend, said, yeah, well, what about the girlfriend experience, which is, in fact, almost an Asian term that has come into parlance now. And what you did, the host bar or the host club that you mentioned just now is an example of that. But 
Honestly, um, anyone who has been to Bangkok or Manila or most of the cities in Asia knows that they, the streets are filled with Western men of every age, uh, hand in hand with very young Asian women whom they've met in bars and whom at some level they're supporting. But what disarms foreign visitors is that from the man's point of view, this isn't... Um, a woman he's paying to be his friend. It's a girlfriend. He's with her for three weeks. He, he takes her on holiday every year. He's, um, it's a companionship uh, he's after as much as the physical gratification. Mm -hmm. uh, for the woman, it may be different, but the men are prepared to suspend belief. And mm -hmm. a 60-year-old guy like myself may go to Thailand and meet a beautiful 20-year-old woman and convince ourselves this is a girlfriend. This is the nature of a relationship. Um, so we, too, are ready to, to make that leap when it <laughs> comforts or reassures us. And when we do that, we can't think too harshly about the Japanese sure. who are doing it, not in the romantic, but in the family context. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at the clock here, and I know we're a little bit um, short on time. If I may, uh, do you have time for one more question? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, I just wanted to ask you about what words of wisdom or advice you would impart on young travelers who are looking to, I guess, have more meaningful experiences in travel and more me meaningful experiences abroad. Uh, the first, the main thing I would say is to follow your passion and your hobby abroad as you do at home. And that will open up a foreign country as nothing else could. I remember when I first went to Japan, I spoke not a word of Japanese. I'd never studied Japan. But I thought to myself, well, I can understand baseball in any language. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I was in Japan for two weeks in 1985, I went and paid homage to the very powerful museum in Hiroshima. I visited Tokyo Disneyland. I spent a lot of time around the temples of Kyoto and Nara. But as I was walking down the street, I would always keep an eye out for how the kids were playing baseball in the street. And when I went to a coffee shop for breakfast, I would note the high school baseball games that were broadcast on TV from dawn to dusk every day. And when I had an occasional free evening, I would go to a baseball game and I would find Japanese who were so well welcoming and boisterous and uh, ready to take me as a friend, even though they're very shy and reserved in most other contexts, um, that I was instantly part of a community in the baseball stadium. And as I was saying before, I saw how baseball, the all-American pastime, becomes something very different and endlessly fascinating in Japan. So if your passion is opera or ballet or uh, the theater or markets, Go there in a foreign country where you're bringing to the conversation quite a lot of interest and knowledge, perhaps. See how it plays out differently. You'll probably meet people there who are much closer to your own interests, even if language is sometimes a, a challenge. Uh, and so maybe that will bring you into um, the country in a way nothing else could. Go and see Swan Lake when you're in Yangon, Myanmar. Go to see um, an Avengers movie when you're in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, walk into McDonald's uh, when you're in Nara and nothing very little in it is going to remind you of America or home. And if you are writing about your travel, I'd say the main thing is to try to find that aspect of your experience, your passions, and your background, which is unique and which will open a door to you that is closed to almost the rest of us. Uh, maybe you know a lot about garden design. Maybe you can read Arabic. Maybe um, you've always been in love with colors. But one way or another, you are sitting on a pair of eyes that most of us are not and use that as the way to cast fresh light on a place the reader thinks she already knows. Excellent advice. I will definitely convey that to my students and, uh, well, use it myself. <laughs> so. Good. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. I really wish you good luck on the podcast and, um, and happy travels and happy writing. I'm really glad I got a chance to talk to you and thank you for reading my book. Thank you very much for your time and agreeing to come on the show. Thank you very much. I hope we'll meet in, in person one day. I hope you enjoyed this episode of All Over the Place. To join in on the conversation, visit the episode show notes and leave a comment.
Don't forget to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app and follow us on social media. Please subscribe to our newsletter to receive emails with travel-related news, book recommendations, and resources from around the world. Links can be found at alloverthepacepodcast.com. Until next time, farewell. Farewell.